Hello everyone and um, welcome to the Scottish Fabians launch of our latest publication, A Voice for the Future. Um, I can see lots of familiar names and uh, lots of new faces as well. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from the Secretary General of FETS, and that's the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, who have very kindly uh, funded this project and has been with us every step of the way uh, with their hard work and inspiration. Over to you, Laszlo. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, let me underline that um, FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, is a proud supporter of uh, this event and um, uh, the launch of a joint publication under the title A Voice for the Future how labor can shape the next 20 years of uh, devolution. We are really proud of our longstanding uh, partnership uh, with the Fabian Society and the Scottish uh, Fabians. And I believe this project in itself is also a sign that FEPS um, uh, is not really affected by Brexit. Um, we would like to continue as before uh, with our cooperations with uh, UK uh, think tanks and we look forward to many similar initiatives as well. Now, while saying that uh, for FEPS, um, uh, Brexit doesn't matter much, of course, we are aware that for a lot of people in the United Kingdom, uh, Brexit has changed uh, a lot um, in um, the living conditions, the working conditions, uh, uh, the economic opportunities, and not necessarily for uh, the better. And it's not only about material issues, uh, but uh, rising nationalism has been a concern. To some extent, rising English nationalism was a cause uh, for Brexit, and rising Scottish nationalism is to some extent a consequence of uh, uh, Brexit. Now, uh, facing uh, uh, nationalism, obviously, uh, for us, um, uh, uh, regionalism is um, a, a progressive alternative. Um, various forms of regionalism have been developed um, uh, by the European Union, and um, uh, I, I, I would like to believe that uh, uh, devolution in the UK also represents a form of um, uh, progressive uh, uh, regionalism, the empowerment of um, uh, local uh, communities, um, which uh, uh, the EU uh, should continue to support, but even if the UK uh, now is not an EU member, we would like to uh, continue with you an analysis of the experience of Scotland uh, with uh, the evolution and how a better future can be built um, on this uh, basis. So I would like to congratulate um, uh, the editors as well as the authors of um, uh, this book and I look forward to hearing uh, the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laszlo. And I mean, I think, yeah, FEPS make a really important point, and that's why we were so lucky to, to have them uh, prepared to work with us. You know, post uh, Brexit, it's not just uh, it's not just about what the you know Scottish Labour can do to strengthen devolution and strengthen democracy. But it's actually an issue for the whole of the UK and also um, and also across Europe. So we're very grateful that we have uh, Nicola McCune here to talk about that and also Paul Kennedy, Kennedy to give a view from Spain. Before we kick off, I'm going to do a plug for the Scottish Fabians. Um, if you are not a member, you can join the Fabian Society um, in the, that's the UK. You can follow us on Twitter at Scottish Fabians and you can follow us um, on Facebook at Scottish Fabians as well. Um, so over to Martin McCluskey, who will present the findings of our report. Thanks, Kath. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here, uh, which hopefully will work. Let me just get the slides up. Okay, here we go. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining um, today. Like you know, like, like both Laszlo and um, Kath have said, this is this has been a big and significant piece of work. 
um, for uh, both FEPS and the Scottish Fabians at, at what is a kind of crucial time for this um, this discussion in Scotland. Um, I've just got a, a, a number of slides today, which I'm not going to I'm not going to dwell on each one for a long time. But we will send these round to people on the call afterwards if you want to look at them in in more detail. Um, just to begin with, the, the the sort of exam question that we we set ourselves at the outset of this project way back at the start of last year was that as as we approach this next set of Hollywood elections, what condition is devolution in um, and what should the agenda be for the next 20 years? We purposefully kept it very wide and very broad in order to kind of give us the opportunity to delve down different uh, avenues that might emerge during the process um, of the research. Um, our research in the first instance focused on two pieces of work. We did a big poll with YouGov um, last summer uh, that was a representative poll of just over a thousand Scottish adults and then we conducted three focus groups um, across a number of different kind of political groups uh, geographically across Scotland. So we did one in Glasgow and the surrounding areas, Edinburgh surrounding areas, then a combined group that took in um, the northeast of Scotland and the Highlands and also a number of people from um, island communities um, as well. And, and that was really the starting point of, as I said, we wanted to keep it broad. So the focus was really to try and understand from that some kind of key reflections on how people first of all, thought that devolution had progressed over the past 20 years um, and where we might go uh, in the future. Um, so what I'm going to do is just take you um, through the findings from, uh, we've kind of split this into two groups, one kind of backward looking and then the next um, a little more um, forward looking. So first of all, um, one of the uh, key questions that we wanted to ask was how much people actually understood about devolution. Um, and it's very easy to forget how recent the Scottish Parliament actually is. Like, you know, we're talking about an institution that's actually only been um, on the scene for just over um, 21, nearly 22 years. That's not a long time in the kind of grand sweep of, of, of history. Um, and it's important to remember as well that it wasn't an institution while, while you know, very well supported in the devolution referendum in 1997. It was an institution that faced um, quite significant uh, challenges in its initial um, years of existence. So one of, the, one of the things we asked people, first of all, was what they understood by devolution and how they understood the, the powers that the parliament had. And while it was, uh, it was encouraging that the vast majority of people were able to um, identify what powers the Parliament had, what power they were, um, there's still a significant minority of people who don't have a complete, complete understanding of, of the government's powers. So just to pick out two examples, you know, just over one in four people thought that the NHS in Scotland, the health service, was um, still the responsibility of the UK government. That's an area of policy that has been devolved since the very beginning um, of devolution and actually administrative devolution going a lot further back than that. Um, you know, and, 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 and the reverse uh, social security in Scotland, which is an area that's obviously still uh, largely reserved um, to the UK government, was an area that almost a third of people thought uh, was already the responsibility of the Scottish government. So. You know, I, I think the way that we probably put this is it was a bit of a kind of, it's like a B plus for the Scottish public's understanding of, of where, what power lies where. Um, and this is important for a number of reasons, not just because it's important that we have a well-educated population, but if we don't have a population that's well-educated and has an understanding of what, of who's in charge of what and what politicians are responsible and accountable for what decisions, it's obviously going to make it very difficult to hold people to account and for Parliament to really exercise um, its scrutiny role. Obviously, the divisions between uh, Westminster and Scotland have been the kind of defining uh, mark of the last decade of Scottish politics. And so we wanted to also understand what people thought of uh, the relationships between our governments, um, which is a, is a theme that's picked up on by a number of contributors, Nicola McEwen, who will speak in a moment, um, but also by Jim Gallagher in the in the book about how our governments can can better interact with each other. And there's clearly a desire among the Scottish public for 
um, for more cooperation between our governments. Um, 74% of people wanted the UK's Scottish government to be cooperating more effectively, and only 10% of people believed that the governments were doing that effectively um, today, which is, which is a cause for concern. Obviously, we were conducting this poll a few months into the COVID crisis. I wouldn't expect that those numbers have shifted significantly since then. If anything, there's probably a higher proportion of people who want the governments to be cooperating well and a lower proportion of people who think that they aren't doing that effectively. But if we're thinking about the future of the United Kingdom, the future of, of devolution, um, it's important that we actually start to grapple with some of these issues around intergovernmental relations that have really been on the back burner for the last kind of two decades. Um, trust is an important issue. Like, as I was speaking about a moment ago, the understanding of devolution is important um, to actually hold people to account. Um, as I also mentioned a moment ago, that you know the institution was uh, one that was you know quite uh, challenged in its initial years, and I think this is probably one of the big success stories is that there's been a significant uh, turnaround in the way people look at Hollywood. You know, so if you go back to 1999 and you think of some of the discourse at the time, it was you know people referred to the Parliament as a Mickey Mouse Parliament. There was a real um, thought of MSPs as sort of secondary to MPs at Westminster. That's no longer the case. Um, the uh, Hollywood Parliament is really seen as the centre of Scottish politics. Um, that is where political action in Scotland really largely takes place. And what our, our research and our polling found was that there is a uh, much higher trust available, uh, uh, much higher trust shown by the uh, Scottish people for their members of the Scottish Parliament than their members of Parliament at Westminster. Um, and that's even true when you look at kind of local MPs versus local um, MSPs. And, you know, while that might seem like something we, we should just take for granted now, that is a big, uh, a big turnaround from um, 20 years ago. Um, but is this trust and is this, um, is this kind of good feeling towards our uh, politicians in Hollywood well placed? You know, is it, does it, do we see that all the way through to kind of better outcomes in public services? And the answer to that, you know, is it's a, it's a mixed record on the Hollywood side um, in terms of public service um, delivery. And we were quite interested in this point that, you know, MSPs have a much higher level of trust. There's generally a kind of, you know, more positive view towards them. Um, and we, we wanted to dig into this idea that even though the Scottish government were, meet, were failing to meet some of their own targets on public services, um, this is something that Professor James Mitchell goes into in more detail in the book. Um, this idea that uh, even though they weren't meeting their own, um, their own targets, that they were kind of seen positively by, um, by the Scottish public. And there were a couple of reasons that we kind of identified for that. One was that there is, there is a kind of sense that um, people uh, are willing to kind of give the Scottish government more leeway. Um, you know, we frequently heard in the focus groups an idea that, uh, you know, the, the, the Scottish government were doing their best, that they were kind of more honest when there were failures um, identified. We actually conducted one of our focus groups on the week that the Scottish government was receiving quite a lot of uh, negative publicity around the decision that they made about uh, exam failures last year. Um, and the, the view from a lot of our focus groups and from our research in that, in that week was that because the government had acknowledged their um, failings, that was something positive that people would look on, which largely isn't what you would normally see when these kind of discussions uh, would occur with the UK government in mind rather than um, the Scottish government. And I think part of this is that, you know, Nicola Sturgeon herself over the last kind of year has attracted high levels of, of public support and that's made a really big difference. Um, comparisons largely are in these groups, and this isn't something I've just seen in this research programme, I've seen it in others, comparisons are largely drawn between Scotland and England, um, and often the uh, results in Scotland are, are more favourable. Um, and, you know, these, these positive kind of views are kind of driven by this idea that we are performing better than England, rather than drawn kind of through people's perceptions of individual politicians and their own their own performance and you know the, the quote on the right hand side of that slide there kind of sums up uh, a lot of the discussions that we were having in groups around this where people are able to identify the government's failings but then they wouldn't necessarily ascribe blame um, to the politicians that are actually in charge they might find somewhere else to to put that blame um, and one of the uh, one of the 
issues that kind of repeatedly came up in the research was about identity. And we don't want to kind of make too, you know, we don't want to make too much of this because obviously this is quite a contested area in terms of how much identity um, impacts on people's political decision making. But there definitely was a link um, between, and more of a link than we've seen in previous research, between people who maybe identify very strongly as um, Scottish more than British and, and their outlook on um, not just the constitutional question, which is kind of uh, well-worn territory, but also in their view of um, of the Scottish government. And one of the ideas that we came up with that we kind of flesh out a little bit more in the book is this idea that, you know, this, this Scottish government has basically kind of become almost like a kind of collective representation for a large group of the Scottish people. So in the way that in the um, 1980s and 1990s, it was the Scottish Labour Party who really benefited from that um, that idea of kind of, you know, one one party kind of encapsulating the um, the views of a large num a large group of the nation. And um, it's now the SNP who have been beneficiaries of that for the past, certainly the past, um, the past decade. Um, and just finally on the backward looking section of the of the research, um, this we conducted this research well before the current um, debate around um, the Scottish Parliament Committee and scrutiny and the Alex Salmond, uh, the Alex Salmond inquiry um, was beginning. Um, I, and even at that point, we we saw a problem in terms of the, the Holyrood Parliament's kind of ability to scrutinise the executive because of kind of, you know, a very strong executive, um, uh, even with a minority government, a very strong executive, a kind of... Uh, committees that had gradually been kind of hollowed out over a course of years, not providing as much scrutiny. Um, and it's something that we examine in chapter seven of the book, Margaret Curran, who's a former minister for parliament, has written a chapter about how we might seek to reform Holyrood, um, which is increasingly more important given not just what's happening right now, but also what we've found in our research around some of these issues about um, the public's understanding and level of understanding of devolution and the ability then to um, scrutinise uh, the actions of the executive. Um, so just a few slides on um, where we go from here, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because Nicola is going to cover this probably in on these sort of themes in a lot better, a, a much better way than I will. Um, but in terms of the next, the next 20 years where things might um, go, our conclusion in the book is that if if we believe in devolution, and this book is obviously coming from a very pro-devolution um, standpoint, if we believe in devolution, we really ha have to come to the conclusion that at the moment it's, it is under threat. Um, and it's, it's, it's under threat on two sides. It's under threat from a kind of what I think the Conservatives would describe as muscular unionism, but that's a unionism that is really seeing a lot of powers being um, you know, brought back to the centre, even if you believe what they say, even if it's just short term, they are still being brought back to the centre. And on the other side from um, independence, which obviously is not um, a natural conclusion of devolution, that's something completely different to devolution. So, you know, for those of us who want to see devolution continue and to be strengthened, how do things look? And at the point that we were conducting this research in the summer, I can't say that things looked massively optimistic. This was probably a point when polling on independence was at the real high watermark, where it seems to have slightly receded from um, over the last month or so. Um, but the, 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 the important thing that we um, found is that, you know, when set against other um, options, the uh, the, the independence option is not the most, um, it, it's still largely the most popular in terms of the number of people who will uh, who will uh, put across in that box, but is not the it is not a, an option that can actually attract support from the majority. So there is, you know, out there a desire to maybe start looking at options for further devolution, for um, strengthening uh, devolution as, as it exists, and also one of the conclusions that we reach is also looking at how the whole of the UK can reform. So our, you know, our, our uh, book does not come down hard on, you know, a set of new powers that should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, though we think there are areas that certainly, um, that certainly do merit more attention. Um, what we do say is that the, the important thing for the next um, discussion around devolution is that it doesn't just focus on powers going from Westminster 
to Holyrood or to any of the devolved um, devolved uh, institutions, but actually starts to think about how, uh, you know, at the centre, how the whole of the UK pulls together. And that's something that um, Nicola McEwen writes about in her chapter, um, but also at the other end, how power is then pushed out of Holyrood down to local government, where we've seen a sort of real hollowing out over the last kind of 10, 15 years of the power of local authorities. And in, in the book, Councillor Eva Murray from Glasgow City Council writes about how the power of um, individual councillors can be can be strengthened, as does um, Sarah Boyack, who we'll hear from in a moment. Um, so uh, that is the, the main takeaways from the research. We, we didn't provide recommendations as such. Um, because our contributors are obviously coming from a, a you know, a, a range of views, but I think it's it's safe to say all within a space where they, you know, they want to see devolution do well. Um, but what we did do is try and pull out um, just five areas where we think that there needs to be uh, further work. Um, and we've just called this, a, a, you know, an agenda for action. It's spelled out in detail in the final um, chapter of the book. So the first is reforming the UK, which Nicola will um, touch on in a moment. The second, and this is really a recommendation for the for the Scottish Labour Party, is how we actually articulate some sort of sense of shared identity and values. Um, that is a space that the, the Scottish Labour Party seems to have, um, they just haven't engaged with it over the last sort of 10 to 15 years. Arguably, they haven't really engaged with it well since 1999 um, in a coherent fashion. Um, the third is strengthening the Scottish Parliament. That's both about, you know, yes, looking at what possibility there might be for further powers, but actually more importantly, how we strengthen the Scottish Parliament as an institution at the moment. Um, empowering local government, you know, how we strengthen the powers of local government and actually give them more freedom to respond to their own local situations. And then finally, and you know, it goes without saying that for, for most of us here, that devolution is a, a means to an end and not an end in itself. And the, 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 the end that we actually want is a fairer, more equal, more socially just um, country. And you know, addressing what James Mitchell calls wicked problems in his um, chapter is the most important thing. And that actually involves, you know, when, both with the powers that we have and anything that might come in the future, having politicians who are willing and able to use political capital to actually try and solve some of the real kind of, you know, problems that have been intractable um, problems in Scottish uh, society for the past two decades. Um, so I will leave it there. Thanks, Kath. Thank you, thank you, Martin. I mean, there, there's tons of there's tons of content uh, there, so you can kind of look at it at your leisure with the book. Um, I'll just say to everyone on the call, there will be a copy sent to uh, Fabian members, so you will receive a copy in the in the post. Um, I'm just I'm conscious of time because I know that Sarah is uh, dashing away. So if you don't mind, Nicola, we'll go to Sarah first. So. Sarah contributed to the book, as Martin says, looking at um, strengthening local democracy, but also, very interestingly, Sarah was part of the first administration, so she's got some reflections on um, what they all came in to do and, and whether that's been a success. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Kath, and I appreciate um, bumping Nicola out of one, otherwise I would probably not say anything today. Um, I just want to thank everyone that's involved in this project because I think it could not be more timely for us to reflect on the Scottish Parliament, but also where it lies in terms of the rest of the UK, um, in terms of the UK Parliament, the Welsh Assembly Government, the English regions, and um, our relationships with Europe. And I think reflecting on all these different levels are, are really important for us. For me, coming back to think about the Parliament um, and think about what we wanted to do in that first term, we were so ambitious, we were so excited, and actually we did so much with big radical ideas, um, new national parks for the first time in Scotland, free bus travel for the over 60s, we were ahead of the game in the UK doing that, um, big expansion of railways after years of promoting motorways, um, land reform, which we started and it was unfinished ambition from the, the Labour government in 1997 with people like Brian Wilson um, and it was part of our core values for, for decades. Um, we kick-started a renewables revolution in Scotland. We invested in childcare that we'd not seen the like of before, which was transformative for women to be able to work and 
make sure that their kids were looked after and we started tackling domestic violence. And some of that was because of the ambitions we had. We'd been out of power for 20 years and we'd been thinking about how could we use this new institution, this new parliament. So 50% of our representatives were female. Um, we had leadership positions taken by women, which was transformative. But my lesson would be that we didn't actually tell people what we were doing. We were not actually political. We were not party political. And our messaging, when I think back, um, I remember in, in the government, the second Labour government, when Henry Quiche came into power, our slogan was what matters is what works as a government. That's because we were in a coalition with the Lib Dems. And when you think back on it, what a terrible slogan. Because although it was right in terms of being pragmatic, it didn't actually communicate the radical change we wanted to deliver. And when I look at the parliament now, which is actually a stronger parliament in terms of power, in terms of finance, and look at how it's not actually being run to the best impact. Educational attainment, we are not just poor in Scotland, but we're one of the world leaders in terms of failure. What, what, an, what a record to have, given the ambitions that we have all got for our young people and for our schools. And that is before the pandemic. Um, we've got the scandal of homelessness, where more people have died from being homeless in Scotland than in any other part of the UK. The fact that we still have homelessness 20 years on from devolution, um, and that we still have a housing market that doesn't actually have regulation that's fit for purpose, in terms of people's rents rocketing and poor quality housing, and the most recent um, abject failure of the Scottish Government to legislate for short-term lets. Drugs deaths, uh, we saw one minister have to leave office, um, and drugs death is still something that is again something that we should have been addressing in Scotland. And it's not just a powers issue, it's a failure to tackle deep-rooted inequalities in our communities. And the deep-rooted inequalities that we've had that existed before the pandemic have now worsened. So for me, thinking about um, the top three issues we were thinking about in this report, the, the, re the differences between different governments and different levels of government, how do we get a socially progressive agenda and not just think about powers, but how they are used, and then how we renew Scottish Labour. It has to be to call out, what do we want our parliament to be for? How does it need to deliver on the issues that people in Scotland care about? Coming through the pandemic and afterwards, it's got to be how does this parliament's powers get used? What kind of government do we have? What ambitions do this government have? And for me, thinking about what our ambitions are going to be about pulling everyone together. Um, and that's something that Anas is absolutely clear on, our new leader, thinking about what we can do, build on the incredible efforts and the work that people have done to keep us alive, to keep us safe through the pandemic, um, and, and not just in our health service and our care workers, but the shops that are still open, the construction sites that are working, to actually keep people in employment and to use the powers of this parliament to actually rebuild our economy again through what, what is potentially the worst economic um, disaster for 300 years. That's a, a big challenge, but the parliament's got powers in terms of job creation, um, in terms of home building, in terms of retrofitting our houses to tackle fuel um, poverty, um, to get a green new deal in place. There are so many things that we could be doing in the short term. And some of the ideas that we've been sharing across the UK, the Alliance for Full Employment, the ideas that have come from We the People, the case for radical federalism, they're about learning from each other. They're critically about using the powers. And I think that's got to be our ambitions, whether it's tackling climate change or rebooting our health service, making the most of the powers we've got, but actually talking with other levels of government. So for me, thinking about the climate emergency, the Scottish government's got critical powers. They need to work with the UK government as equals. Their powers are different, but they need to work together. A shared ambition in the run up to COP26 this year. But crucially, and it was mentioned by um, Martin in his opening, local government the power of local communities and local accountability, the irony of the parliament we fought for for 20 years, being a centralising parliament, a parliament that took powers away from our local government. And when we're tackling the climate emergency, it's about fair funding for local government and it's about leadership. Leadership of the government, leadership of the parliament to work with local councils, because local authorities and communities have knowledge, they have ambitions locally, it can't be delivered by a top-down government, but they can be delivered when they work together, when they treat each other as equals. So that narrative that's in our, our book about 
the UK and the Scottish government working with each other. And they don't have to agree on everything. Uh, that's probably not possible with a Tory government that's committed to austerity um, and a, a Scottish government that's looking for independence. But there are still things they have a duty to work together on. And the Scottish government working with our local councils, who are not all Labour, but they still want the powers, they still want the capacity to change the world. And I think one of the things that's been empowering for us in the last year is having that debate about how we, how we don't just strengthen our parliament and strengthen devolution and make it work better for the next 20 years, but how does it respect local government and give the same respect to our local authority colleagues that we would expect the UK government to give to the Scottish government. So it's about sharing power, but it's also about using power, tackling the deep-rooted inequalities and, and bringing success to our country in a country that is going to have come through um, the challenges of the pandemic. We've got to view it as an opportunity to rebuild, rebuilding our NHS, rebuilding um, our educational system, tackling a climate emergency and doing all of those in a joined up way, not just within the powers of the parliament, but sharing those powers and the political leadership that works with our local councils. I think that's really exciting. And in the last week, we've all been focusing in Labour about how we use those powers, how we, how we have the transformative change that was on our agenda in 1999. And I think that's exciting. And we are currently way behind in the polls. But I think if we focus on what the, what the parliament should be doing in the next five years and focusing on what the opportunities are, um, then I think there's an exciting agenda there. I've, I've watched in the last year and a half since I've come back to the parliament of Scottish Labour coming up with ideas about how do you transform care, a national care service, national terms conditions, um, enabling people who are low paid staff, often women, to have careers for the future. Um, and watch that agenda be stolen off us and again centralised. So there's a lot a lot of work for us to do to make sure the powers of the parliament are used to the full and, and to use them in a way that will actually transform people's lives trans and tackle the inequalities and create the jobs we need. And, and with COP26 coming down the road to do it in a way that will actually save our planet. So we're, we're not lacking ambition we're not lacking in ideas. And actually it's gonna be reaching out to people to say, surely we can do better in Scotland than this current government has done. And that's got to be our agenda. So it's great to join this, um, this team today. I'm not gonna be able to answer all the questions, but Kath, if there's any questions for me particularly, I would be happy to deal with them afterwards and get back to people. It's great to join this group, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. That was that was fantastic. Yes, if anyone does have any questions, if they put them in the question and answer, if we have time at the end, great. Um, and if it's anything particular for Sarah, then I will make sure that Sarah gets them and answers them. I uh, just want to pick up on a lot of Sarah's points in terms of sharing of powers, because that leads very nicely onto what Nicola is going to talk about. Uh, Nicola. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Catherine, and thanks for the invitation to to join you. Just first of all, congratulations uh, to the Scottish Fabians for putting uh, this collection together. I'm very honoured uh, to be a part of it. And congrats also to Anna Sarwar on his uh, new leadership appointment. I was pleased to see in the foreword of the book that there is a willingness uh, there on the part of the leadership to engage uh, with constitutional issues. Because for a long time, uh, as an observer, it has seen that um, there is perhaps a tendency to to will the constitutional question away. Um, you often hear um, Labour politicians say, well, I didn't get into politics to talk about the constitution and I, I totally, totally get that. Um, but the future of devolution in the UK, of Scotland's place within these islands is a very real issue. And it's an issue uh, that a lot of people attach a lot of importance to. And while I, I accept um, completely the points that Sarah was making about the powers that the Parliament already has, and they are not insubstantial at all. Um, but there is also a need to acknowledge and recognise that the, the ability of the Parliament to do certain things is shaped by the constitutional framework in which it operates. And so the perspective that I have here is not as a member of the Labour Party or any other uh, political party. I'm a, an academic. I've been studying um, devolution and observing Scottish politics for um, a very long time. Um, I'll not say how long, I'll make me feel very old. 
And so it's just about offering constructive uh, suggestions uh, to to yourselves, to to the wider party, to the new constitutional commission um, uh, once it is up and running. Um, I have um, quite a lot of sympathy um, for those of you that have read the, the, the booklet with the diagnosis of the problem that Gordon Brown set out um, in his essay, um, the view that Brexit has uh, led to a deterioration of the relationships between, not just between the Scottish government and the UK government, but actually between uh, all of the devolved institutions um, and uh, the UK government. The Internal Market Act, the, the legislation that was passed just before Christmas, despite the withholding of consent from all of the devolved institutions, um, has led to a recentralization of power. Um, but thinking then, so recognizing the problem, what then do you do about it? And there's a few things that I would suggest um, are important to, to bear in mind. Um, I agree with the view that it's not just about um, the powers that the parliament has, though I am on record of saying that I think the devolution settlement um, will need revisiting um, at some point. And just maybe to, to, to challenge Martin a little bit on the, the presentation of the findings, I wonder if maybe the electorate are a little bit more sophisticated than you're giving them credit for, um, because the devolution settlement, um, particularly since 2016, is a lot more interdependent than it was before. It's never been completely separate about the responsibilities of the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament. And it's definitely not the case now. So there is um, a, a, a more sort of jagged edges between uh, the, the settlements. And I think, um, you know, broadly that may be, may be recognised, but that also raises issues um, about how the Parliament, how the governments in particular work together and the extent to which um, the devolved governments can help to shape um, those UK policies um, that affect their powers and responsibilities. In the academic literature, we talk about that in terms of, of shared rule as opposed to the self-rule or self-government or home rule uh, that has domin so dominated uh, the debate uh, over the de devolution uh, within Scotland. So any proposals for reform, I think, have to recognise that the UK is a multinational democracy, that Scotland has the status of a nation within the UK. And that's where I'm a bit skeptical about um, the periodic plans that are presented to uh, reform the House of Lords into a, a, a chamber of, of the nations and regions. Well, there's merit in, in, in that for sure, uh, but it's not something that is going to particularly address um, the issues that, that dominate politics in Scotland because Scotland's voice inevitably it would be diluted uh, within such a chamber given its relative size um, compared to well, the largest neighbour to the south of course. Um, so I do think that the, the potential is greater in um, the intergovernmental relationships in sorting out that machinery of intergovernmental relations in looking at the processes, the rules um, the practice and the culture of intergovernmental relationships, not just in areas that are devolved. So you might be familiar with, um, there's been lots of discussions around common frameworks uh, post Brexit, where the governments have all been working together quite well, actually, particularly among officials, to try and sort out common frameworks where they think these might be needed to replace European Union uh, frameworks or European Union law. Um, but all of that is in areas that are already devolved. Um, but shared rule is not just about that. And in fact, it's not primarily about that. It's about finding ways to enable um, the devolved governments to have an influence over things like trade or, um, say, I mentioned COP26. So that clearly affects a devolved area of competence, but it's an area of international agreement where uh, the Scottish government doesn't have a formal role to play. So finding ways to, to build those relationships, to give a genuine opportunity to influence uh, those sorts of decisions to the devolved governments um, and recognising that when they do come together to talk about areas that are devolved, whether it's drugs policy or, or health, then they do so as equals um, within their areas 
of jurisdiction. And that is, hasn't really been the case um, so far. And the final thing I would just say is that um, the Sewell Convention, that convention where the UK Parliament doesn't normally legislate uh, on devolved matters uh, without the consent of the devolved parliaments, well, that's taking something of a battering of late, um, not least in the UK Internal Market Act uh, that I just uh, mentioned. So some ways to restore what was an important principle underpinning devolution and the status of the devolved institutions um, within the UK's constitution, I think is important. Um, and that could be tinkering with it. It could be removing some of the ambiguity about what normally means um, in, in the words of the convention, but it could be something bolder and something more radical um, around maybe giving uh, veto powers to the devolved institutions where the UK Parliament is uh, looking to change their powers or is uh, looking to pass laws in devolved areas. Um, and just the, the final comment from me is that I'll, I've been talking a lot about the devolved governments vis-a-vis -vis the UK government um, and that's the area that I most uh, study in, in terms of my research but I have a lot of sympathy uh, with some of the points that Sarah was making about the, the relationships between the Scottish government and local government, because it does seem to me that many of the frustrations uh, that the Scottish government has in its relationship with the UK government are also felt by local governments in their relationship with the Scottish government. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And we do, we so appreciate your contribution and um, and thank you for that constructive criticism as well, which we'll take on, we'll take on board. Um, this, this project was really important that it didn't just become another kind of Scottish Labour talking about uh, the constitution talking amongst itself. We really did want to widen it out and that's why we're really grateful to have Nicola and also um, Professor James Mitchell in the publication as well. But what we also wanted to explore was this idea of how other European countries had dealt with devolution and, and dealt with these kind of, um, you know, sub-national parties. Um, so Paul, Professor Paul Kennedy is going to talk to us about that and has some really some fascinating insights from Spain. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Catherine. I'm very pleased to, uh, to take part in this. I think it's really interesting. And um, it's even made me think differently about Spain and Catalonia, which is my, uh, you know, the subject of my talk today. But I start off by sort of playing down comparisons that, um, you, know, you, you know, the phrase and invidious comparisons. And I just noticed in one of Martin's slides there, I noticed that there was the odd Catalan flag there amidst the, uh, the, the Scottish flags as well. I'm not too sure why, because there are parallels, but there are lots of differences as well, which is what you'd expect. But uh, I think there, there could be a few lessons, though, um, treated with caution, but still maybe a, of interest to, to, to people. Um, this came up at an, an interesting uh, time. Catherine approached me just as the Catalan elections, the regional elections, were about to take place. And uh, the, the background really to it is that the, the Catalan Socialist Party, the PS. C um, was emerged as the largest party of, of all the parties who presented themselves at the, the election. So it did come just by total uh, coincidence at, at a good time for me. And then it set me thinking about the, the parallels between Scottish Labour and uh, the Labour Party in, in Westminster and the, the Catalan. Uh, Socialist Party and, and the, uh, the PSOE, the PSOE, which are kind of the main political uh, Spanish Socialist Party based in Madrid. Um, the Catalan Party, interestingly enough, has a unique status within uh, the PSOE. It, it has full sovereignty with respect to its activities. And you probably wouldn't be surprised to, to find out that um, there have been quite a few episodes of tensions between Barcelona and, and Madrid. The other parallel that I think is important is almost going beyond the usefulness of, of, of the situation in, in, in Catalonia, uh, within Catalonia itself, is, is, is the importance to, to, to the nation as a whole. Now, it seems to me that, that, that the Labour Party without Scotland is not the Labour Party you know, that, that we all wish to see. Uh, and we have a similar situation in Spain, in actual fact, that uh, there's almost an adage that if the PSOE 
the Socialist Party, the Spanish Socialist Party, wishes to be successful, uh, it really can't do so without having Catalonia on board. So this um, recent result by the Catalan Socialist Party uh, is, and may have further uh, um, consequences for the future, because it certainly strengthened the, the hand of the, the, the the Madrid government, um, um, Pedro Sanchez in, in Madrid. Uh, and on the, on the line, I don't want to go into too much detail of, of national and subnational stuff, but it's also weakened the hand of the uh, Podemos, who is the other um, coalition partner. That, but that's another story. But maybe certainly strengthen the socialists. Um, now, why is this interesting for us? Because I think against the odds, the, the Catalan socialists, uh, together with uh, the Spanish socialists, uh, have um, shown themselves capable of, um, of re-establishing themselves, re-emerging as the most important party opposed to independence. Uh, of course, the Socialist Party ha has never and never will support uh, the right to self-determination of, of, of any Spanish region, and that's clear. But, and I think this is the important thing, and this is the thing that, that Catherine was, uh, you know, uh, asking me to really bear in mind, I think I can say this without any problem, without in the process denying its adherence to the region's national and cultural identity. The PSFA, the, the Catalan Socialist Party, the Catalan branch of the, the Spanish Socialist Party, um, uh, has its full adherence to national and cultural identity. It's seen as a, a very much a pro-Catalan party, but a pro-Catalan party needn't necessarily, of course, be a pro-independence party. Uh, that um, This is not necessarily disadvantageous. I'd even go as far as to say it could be quite the reverse in the current circumstances. Um, the other thing that is, is, I don't know whether I need to remind you of this, I'm sure you're well aware of it, that Spain is already one of the most decentralised countries in Europe. Um, as we, we saw before with Martin's slides and so on, uh, health care and education, uh, not just to devolve to, to, to one country like, like Scotland, but to, to all 17 uh, autonomous regions in Spain, uh, more so decentralised than Germany. Uh, Catalonia, which is uh, what I'm talking about, is, is Spain's most prosperous region. So you may even ask yourself, well, why the shift over the last decade? Well, the global financial crisis is, is the obvious thing. But uh, in Catalonia, again, it's like a, a mini system. But the anger against the political class in the rest of Spain, which brought about the new parties such as Podemos, uh, translated in Catalonia into a mobilisation in favour of independence. And of course, this posed problems for the electoral strength of both the, the Catalan Socialist Party and the Pesce more, more generally. Um, the, the, the centre-right also pulled off the trick of sort of latching on to independence as a way of, sort of distancing itself from being up to its eyes and ears in corruption. The, the, the guy who'd been president of Catalonia, the, of the region for much of the you know, last 40 years, a guy called Jordi Pujol, has been sort of taken backhanders for, uh, for decades. And the idea of uh, saying, oh, no, forget about that. Let's forget about the fact that we're a centre-right party, because it's also a centre-right Catalan regionalist party, which has been in, in, in office for most of the last 40 years, um, has uh, the opportunity of saying, oh, it's in fact, it's all Madrid's fault. And the, the big line in, in Catalan, in Madrid ens roba, which is that Madrid is uh, stealing from us, yeah? Um, if you look at the, the actual figures, though, the figures don't stack up. And if anybody is interested in this, I'm sure you'll have heard of a guy called um, Josep Borrell, who's now in kind of in the European Union as one of their uh, kind of uh, bigwigs. And he's written some excellent stuff, actually, given the figures. And it really doesn't stack up in terms of Catalonia being better off outside of Spain. So the uh, Catalan uh, Socialist Party emerged as the major independence party. Uh, get, get to obtain more votes than any other party, so than, more than any other pro-independence or anti-independence party. Uh, they equaled the 33 seats won by the leading pro-independence party, the Catalan Republican Party, Esquerra Republicana, it's ERC. Um, and it, it was a surprisingly, I'd have to say, a surprisingly good uh, result. Um, how can we explain it? Again, I don't want to go into too great detail, because I've not got that much time, but one of the riskiest things the Catalan Socialists did is they put up Spain's um, recent health minister, the guy who's been in charge of the, the anti-COVID, you know, the, the COVID response from, from Madrid. He's a Catalan guy, Ilya, and he came over as their presidential candidate and actually went down rather well. I, say, I think it was risky because who's to say whether or not 
um, populations will judge uh, a government's handling of such a serious crisis uh, you know, favorably, but it appeared that it went down fairly well. There's also been a, a lot of fighting both in the pro-independence uh, group uh, lobby and in the anti-independence lobby, and the socialists almost kind of came through the middle as a result of that. Another thing to talk about is the question of uh, some sort of defining features of, 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 Cat of Catalan and Spanish socialism more generally, just to, to wind up, because I don't want to be rambling on for too long. But um, if I had to choose just one word to, to describe the, the Spanish socialism, and it's, it was like one of the oldest socialist parties anyway, founded in 1879, that word would be resilience. Uh, it really is quite good at kind of coming back. Um, and it can't be written off uh, at both the regional and the national level. I think it's a regional if we're talking about Catalonia here. So sort of, kind of stubborn endurance. But the, these sort of things are, are, are no good unless you put in place. And this is where my criticism of, of Scottish Labour comes in a little bit, I think. Um, but I'd be very happy for people to have a go at me, you know, if I'm not right here. But it seemed that there was quite a bit of hubris in, within Scottish Labour. It seemed as if there was quite a bit of complacency. And the whole idea of, uh, you know, of mobilizing the vote of actually electioneering and so on kind of went by the, uh, it was sort of marginalized to an extent over, over the last decade or so, and boy, have, have Labour paid for it. Whereas I think in Spain or in Catalonia, I'd suggest that um, the, the Catalan Socialist Party remained a formidable force within particular uh, strongholds, uh, particularly Barcelona. Barcelona has been kind of the industrial place, post-industrial now, I suppose, but it, it still has a kind of a red belt, a kind of industrial zones around Barcelona. Also around another city that I used to work in, in actual fact, I used to work in the red zone myself, teaching English uh, in a city called Tarragona. Uh, the Catalan socialists have been very keen to ensure that uh, they respond to, to local populations. These populations often frequently having roots beyond the region, so kind of useful in terms of gaining support. Um, also, another thing that came up before in, uh, in, in some of the other contributions is the question of the importance of local government and, and ensuring that a contribution is made at that at that level and I, I would again argue that, that the Catalan Socialist Party has, has really striven to to do that. Um, I didn't go back as far as to say historically one of the things about the Socialist Party and this is going back over a hundred years yeah is that kind of one of the sort of cliches about Spanish politics is that every tiny little place in Spain wherever it was in Spain had two institutions yeah one was the Catholic Church the other was, was, I think, called the Casa del Pueblo. This is like the, the local branch office of the Socialist Party. They, they have a presence wherever you go. And this, I think, has been important in terms of, uh, uh, of keeping, keeping uh, getting ready for the next election. And I think it really put, came up trumps this time. The only institution capable of competing with the Catholic Church historically, the length and breadth of Spain. Um, but even that, of course, is not enough. You've still got to uh, cope with the demands of the 21st century. And I've been reading about these Casas del Pueblo, these little uh, local branch offices. And the idea is, you know, they've had to keep up on top of, um, you know, um, Internet um, communication and so on with, uh, with, with, with the electorate and so on. So if there is a lesson, uh, it's, well, first of all, not to be too pessimistic, because I, I can tell you that as late as November of last year, things look fairly grim. Uh, in the run-up to these elections, but uh, as I repeat, the Spanish Socialist Party came out as the biggest party. Um, support can't be taken for granted, though, and I don't think they ever did that. There's no complacency. But progress can be made on the back of effective campaigning, which makes the most of other parties' weaknesses in the in the sense that there were weaknesses both within the, the pro-independence groups because okay, you've got this very incoherent group in favor of ind independence which is is one of the disadvantages to the whole question of of, of independence in catalonia because you have like a, this anti-system republican left who are kind of a bunch of lefties you've got this very tiny little trotskyite group called the cup and they're kind of allied to this almost like quasi-tory party at a regional level um, who are kind of in favour of, you know, the sort of things that Tories like, you know, business and all the rest of it. Um, and then in the, uh, in the other side, uh, you've got um, the, the Popular Party, which are the sort of, dare I say, the sister party of the Conservative Party. And, and they've been, again, up to their eyes and ears in corruption, I'm afraid to say, and they suffered for it. They got their worst result ever at the, the, 
regional election. And then I'm afraid the worst thing I've got to say is that um, I've always been proud of the fact that Spain haven't had a far right party. You know, there never was a sort of Farage figure or whatever, at least not since Franco uh, snuffed it. But um, this Vox thing are really coming through now. And they were the other great success story uh, of the election. I hate to say they got 11 seats from nothing. Uh, and and uh, the idea of any sort of... Um, seepage of, of support from the Catalan, from the, from the, any, any part of the Socialist Party to Vox is something that I'm looking into myself actually for an, another project that I'm doing. There was another party as well, Ciudadanos, who were citizens, and they were sort of the most important party at the last regional elections in 2017, but they, they offer another lesson. They went to almost nothing. They went from 36 seats, which is the biggest amount of, of, of the region, to, to just six. Uh, they, they've kind of shown in the Spanish context, and again, this is kind of frightening if you think of things historically, there's no room for a centrist party other than, in my own kind of hypothesis here, um, the, Catal the, the actual Spanish Socialist Party itself, which can kind of park itself in the centre and make, make a fairly decent job of it. Um, so progress can be made on the back of effective campaigning, which makes the most of other parties' weaknesses, within the context of hard organisational uh, and mobilisational graft. So I hope that's, uh, that's okay. I'll, shall I leave it there? Because otherwise I'll just ramble on. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That was, that was, uh, that was fascinating. Now, I, I hope that um, ourselves and the team at BEP, Celine and Anya, will carry on working together. Because I think, you know, with post-Brexit, we mustn't lose the opportunity. We still have to work together across the across the left. I think that's so interesting about your contribution is, uh, you know, the lessons that come from Spain. And I've just kind of written down resilience and, uh, you know, battling for survival. Like that's quite pertinent um, for Scottish Labour, but also not to take their support for granted, which I think you're right. We have been guilty of. Um, Sarah and Nicola both uh, mentioned Anast, who has become the new leader of the Socialist Party, and he wrote, he kindly wrote a foreword for us. He's not here today, but Martin, um, we've got a small clip that he's going, going to play just to kind of position where the Labour Party is, and then we'll take some questions. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry I can't actually be at the book launch today. But I want to congratulate everyone that's been involved. Particular thank you to the Fabians and Feps for putting this book together and to the amazing editors of the book, both Martin McClessey and Catherine Sangster, who've done a phenomenal job in putting the book together. A voice for the future. And as we look to the future of the Scottish Labour Party and the future of Scotland and the UK, I think it's important to reflect on those words by Donald Dewar. This is a really important piece of work. And I think coming through COVID, People right across the UK feel a disconnect from Boris Johnson and the UK government. And I think they feel that disconnect, not just in Scotland. I think people in Liverpool, Birmingham, Manchester, London, Birmingham, feel that same disconnect as I do sitting here in Glasgow or other people do across other parts of Scotland. And if we are to build a recovery that works for everyone, it is absolutely crucial that we push power out of Westminster into the nations and regions of the UK. And I would go further and say we push power out of Holyrood into our local authorities across the UK. Not just power, but resources out from Westminster to the nations and regions and resources out from the Scottish Parliament to local authorities so we can have a recovery that works for everyone. So we can have a recovery that takes in every part of our UK. And we can also protect uh, the institution of the United Kingdom at the same time. There is no doubt that the UK is in need of major reform and the Labour Party as the party of devolution has got to be at the heart of that debate and that's why uh, I was delighted that Keir Starmer uh, announced the Constitutional Commission uh, that is being advised by Gordon Brown. I was our own party's constitutional spokesperson in Scotland uh, at the time. That is a really significant and important piece of work as we run into the Scottish Parliament election campaign in May and then the upcoming general election campaign uh, down the road. That's why it's really important that we get behind this piece of work led by Gordon Brown, who I know has done a chapter in this book too. And the ideas and the energy and the enthusiasm that's come through in this book is what we need in that Constitutional Commission. Because we have a duty. We have a duty to protect devolution, to enhance devolution and grow devolution. Independence is not uh, the end point of devolution. It's uh, a completely separate concept to devolution. And the Tories are never going to defend devolution because they've never believed in devolution in the first place. Instead, I would regard myself 
as probably the two editors of the book themselves are, the devolution generation. Um, I've not known a day of my adult life when there hasn't been a Scottish Parliament as well as a Westminster Parliament. And if we want to focus uh, on transforming our country here in Scotland, but also transforming across the whole of the UK, how we have a constitutional settlement that works for all parts of the UK is absolutely crucial to that. Thank you, uh, Martin. I think the, the important point for Martin and I in echoed and what Anas said is that, you know, we become the defenders of devolution. And whilst in, in the book we do, we, we offer some um, scrutiny and how to strengthen devolution, we, we want to be very clear that this is about because we care about it and it should be at the heart of everything that we do. Um, is there any questions from the audience? We've overrun a bit, but we've got time to do a couple of questions, I think, if anyone would like to ask anything. Sorry, there's one come in on the, the WhatsApp from Maggie McTiernan, so I will just uh, I will just read it out. Forgive, forgive me for a second. Um, so Maggie McTiernan asks, we need to start a healthy discussion about where power lies and also how we stop seeing power as a zero sum game um, held tight by one, uh, one institution. Um, but sometimes that should be shared. Um, and always including those who will be affected by the decisions. So I suppose the question to the panelists is how do, how do we go about that and how do we start uh, ensuring that power gets to where it needs to be? I will go to Martin first. Kath, I need to apologise. My internet just cut out just as you invited questions and came back just as you were summarising. So maybe go to someone else first. I'll try and pick up the thread. I'll go to Nicola. <clears throat> Hi. Um, great question. Um, and it doesn't have an easy answer, of course. Um, when you were reading the question out, I, I was thinking of um, the Citizens' Assembly initiative that I was just involved in the, the first Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. Um, and I do think that these sorts of forums have an important role to play in engaging with those who will be affected by however we determine the distribution of powers. Um, I absolutely agree that it shouldn't be a zero-sum game. Um, I also would discourage um, people from thinking that it has to be sorted out once and for all. Um, I think in any country that has federalism or something that looks a little bit like it, um, which is where, where the UK is at the moment, um, it's, it has to be an evolving thing. You have to c continually work at it and review it and refresh it and not see a revision, or a need to revise or, or, or change the settlement as as a definitive outcome or a weakness if you have to go back and visit it. It's just an evolving thing. Um, and managing the relationships between the different parts, however power is distributed among them, formally, um, will, will always always just be something that we have to work at if you want the whole thing to hang together. Thank you, Paul. I think uh, making the, the greatest use of, 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 of what is already constitutionally possible, I think, rather than breaking beyond that. In the Spanish context, um, one of the things that started off this, this kind of whole uh, issue about independence in Scotland, interestingly enough, was, was the, the Spanish government back in the under Zapatero, back in between 2004 and 2008, it passed a new statute because it realised that, that the each region had had a, a kind of a regional statute for about 30 or 40 years, which is a bit out of date, really. So the idea was simply to bring it up to date and to make it a bit more responsive to the region's needs. And in fact, Catalonia uh, uh, got its statute as a bit of a palaver because it had to sort of go through the, the Catalan parliament. Then it went to the Madrid parliament, bits of it were rejected, that went back to the Catalan parliament. But to cut a long story short, um, about 70 odd percent of the Catalans actually voted in favour of this thing in 2006. Now, Spain being Spain, the main Conservative Party, the 
popular party actually sent this to the, the, the constitutional court and said there were certain aspects of it which were not legal. Um, it took about four years for a ruling to, would you believe, 2010, that the ruling came out that actually found in favour that, that parts of it weren't constitutional. And the rejection of the statute, uh, the rejection of, of important parts and quite sensitive things like the question of words like the nation, whether you can apply the word nation to Catalonia, uh, led to, uh, in the context of the, the global financial crisis already starting a couple of years before, to the whole uh, sh drift or shift towards independence. Now, we have a, a, a socialist government once again in, in office, supported by an even leftier party with Podemos, as we speak. Now, I would argue simply that what the, the Fasoe would have to do, what the government will have to do, is maybe revisit the, the issue of the statute in order to make uh, the existing, you know, but according, in accordance with the Spanish constitution, um, uh, any further reforms uh, doable. But what I can't uh, obviously suggest they do is, is in any way um, endorse a shift towards independence itself. But the idea is that working within the existing framework would in any way prevent uh, that sort of desire towards uh, outright independence. Can I just say a final thing just before I go on? The other sensitive thing is, is I don't know whether you're aware of the fact that you, about three years ago, four years ago, when the election took place in October, it was a, it was a referendum, an informal referendum. You'll have remembered the awful scenes of like the security forces, the uh, kind of laying into people who were voting in the referendum in October of 2017. That led to... Um, Catalan pro-independence people actually being jailed. One of the big issues as we speak is whether a pardon can be offered to those people who are given ridiculous sentences, like 10 years or whatever, you know, sentences for, for having endorsed a, a referendum. Um, but this, again, you can imagine this is a real sort of, um, a real problem because they'll be criticised, the government will be criticised for in any way endorsing independence. Uh, I repeat though, I mean, I, I've been following the Socialist Party for, for years, they are not a pro-independence party, but they can at least show a gesture to the region, although Spain has a separation of powers, to uh, kind of suggest to the, 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 the judicial office, uh, powers in, it, 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 within Spain uh, that they look favourably on, I think, a more humane solution to, to what, what I thought went far too too, too far but with the jailing of, of of regional politicians okay sorry about that rambling response but there we go uh, that was that was excellent thank you we've got one more question and then um i will round up because i'm conscious that this is people's lunch hours uh, etc um but it's, there's been so much in the discussion it's been fab so i'll go to martin to answer this question see his internet cut out during the during the last one this is from john mckee and uh, he says one of the main issues of devolution has been the uneven and patchwork nature of devolution across the uk um, how does this book and the panelists see how this is going to work out in the constitutional question and how should further Scottish devolution be advanced in the context of reform of the wider UK constitution? Thanks, Kath. I think to Joy's question, in the first instance, I'd probably repeat something that Nicola said um, earlier, which is I, it, I don't see the need for it to necessarily um, proceed in the same at the same rate all over the UK, like we've always had, you know, asymmetric devolution and there's no reason why that's suddenly going to stop and everything's going to be consistent. Um, I think everyone's on the on their own journey with this, like, you know, the northern mayors versus where we are versus where Wales are. And it's it's going to be, it's probably going to continue looking a bit like a patchwork, but I suppose the, the key point is the points that Nicola made, which is how do you reform how do you reform the centre and how do you maybe start to look at the architecture around shared rule rather than um, rather than just self-rule? Um, on a, from a political point of view, from you know, just speaking um, about the Labour Party for a moment, I think there's a question for Labour about actually going back to first principles as well and not just engaging in an auction of powers because we think that's an easy political fix. Um, you know, I've, I've got no problem with discussions around further devolution um, to the Scottish Parliament. I've got no problem with discussions around, say, you know, immigration. Um, there's points in the book around some of the financial powers that might need to be 
um, might need to be sorted out over the next couple of years. But I don't think that's where we should start. I think we should start from a point of um, how can we fix the thing that's really broken, which is the UK's governance to begin with. And also how can we how can we fix the other end, which is the devolution from Holyrood to local government, as well as looking at powers for the Scottish Parliament. I think our problem, like we've had a lot of problems in how we engage or don't engage with this issue over the last kind of 10 to 15 years. But one of our major problems has been we've, we've become fixated on the devolution of powers from Westminster to Holyrood as the only bit of the devolution jigsaw. And if we keep doing that, we're going to keep hitting up against the same wall, um, not just because politically it's not going to fix the problem, but um, in, in a practical constitutional sense, it's not necessarily the best way to, to carry on progressing. Great, thank you. Can I come to Paul next? I, I, I have nothing much to add to what I've said, I've said before, to be, to be honest, Catherine. Uh, all I would say is that, um, that, that, that this is a dynamic process and that, you know, you've, you've never finished, you know, that one of the kind of, I suppose, the, um, the oddest things about Spain's system of devolution of powers is that it's very open ended. It's actually quite messy. And if you look at it, you think, my God, I, you know, I wouldn't do this anywhere else. But it kind of works for Spain with, of course, the odd hiccup. But one of the bizarre things at the moment, of course, is that you've got a region like the Basque Country, which has had, you know, gave us, gave us over, over 800 deaths due to ETA and due to the violence and so on. And that seems to be relatively happy at the moment. And then we've got this Catalonia thing here, whereby you know, this is the biggest issue since the global financial crisis. And it's, of course, of course, it is linked to the global financial crisis. So what I would suggest is that it, it requires imagination from the likes of the, 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 Catalan, the Catalan Socialist Party and the Spanish Socialist government, gen, generally speaking, to, 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 to in some way, um, again, rep I'm repeating myself, to use the existing framework to offer um, more, um, offer more to, 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 to the regions and particularly Catalonia. I do think, I mean, I've got to be careful here because as a sort of political scientist, the last thing you want to be doing is making too many predictions because that does make you look foolish. But it does look to me that despite the fact that, that for instance, in the recent election just a couple of weeks ago, the, the, the pro-independence parties were about 54%. But the, uh, the turnout was really low down. It looks as if, to an extent, it looks as if it, it could have peaked the sort of drift towards independence. If that is true, I think that kind of endorses what I've said, that there is room within the movement um, short of independence to offer further opportunities. Thank you. Um, I think it's really interesting you say it's a never-ending process, and I think some politicians here have probably made that mistake that it's been it's sort of been seen as right we've done it now we've done devolution and let's draw a line under it um which i think is quite interesting um i'll give the last word to nicola because i think she's probably got quite a lot to say on this um only very briefly because i have to have to go as well but just i, I mean i agree with everything that martin said I, I think there is no need to have a one size fits all approach but we do also have to recognize that changes made in one part of the UK will have an impact potentially in, in other parts of the UK and particularly if we are looking at um, reforming intergovernmental relations then the, the, the elephant in the room is how England is governed and that I think addressing that has to be part of um, the, the discussion and debate about how you reform the relationships between the constituent parts and that would also help uh, to um, reinforce the point that devolution isn't just something that happened to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it's something that happened to the UK and UK government, one of the, the lessons that we see from 1999 onwards is that it was too easy for successive UK governments to think that devolution happened somewhere else and therefore they didn't really need to change anything um, to the way that the UK was governed or to the way that the UK government operated as, as in, in terms of its own machinery. Um, and I don't think that's um, adequate. And I think that has contributed to some of the, some of the challenges that have emerged. So um, that's the only thing I would add to, to what Martin is saying. It's, it's about the UK government looking at itself as well and its position within um, a system of devolution 
um, irrespective of whether that becomes a system of devolution that operates across uh, the UK, but it, what happens at the core also it matters to all of us. I'm sorry, I have to go now, so thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your time. Um, thanks everyone, thanks to our panellists, um, and thanks to all the attendees, uh, particularly to our funders, FIPS, um, and to the team there, Celine and Anya, who have just been absolutely fantastic. The report is available online. Uh, you can download it from the Fabian Society. It will be sent to members and you can also buy it if you wish. So please get in touch with us. Thank you so much.